All right, so um, we'll, uh, we'll look at Bayesian inference today. Um, let me uh, let me start by saying this. So I, I got I saw some stuff on Campus Wire, and then um, and people asked me questions in office hours yesterday, and um, and I think maybe it was something I wrote in the slide was confusing. So I, I want to kind of just clarify a couple things, okay? And um, and so one, the likelihood function of a binomial probability is not the beta distribution, okay? So don't use the beta distribution function for the likelihood of a binomial probability, okay? The likelihood of a binomial probability is gonna be, uh, you know, it's basically your binomial binomial function with, you know, n choose z, theta raised to the z, one minus theta raised to the n minus z, okay? And when the key is for a likelihood function, um, n and z are fixed values. These are coming from your data. So n and z is fixed, okay? Where uh, theta is the variable. And so if you needed to find the likelihood function, you can use d binome, z and theta, and z and n are gonna be fixed values. And theta is gonna be, you know, a variable that ranges from zero to one, okay? So you can, you can do uh, d binome, all right? But don't use d beta, okay? Don't use uh, don't use the beta distribution. All right. The perhaps the confusion comes from the fact that the likelihood function of a binomial probability is proportional to. Okay, it's proportional to, but it's not equal to the uh, a beta PDF. Okay, it's proportional but not equal to a beta PDF with alpha equal to z plus one and beta equal to n minus z plus one. Okay, so it's proportional to these things uh, to a beta PDF, but it's not equal to that, okay? And so it's very important to note that the likelihood function does not integrate to one. So if you integrate this likelihood function across all possible values of theta, it will not integrate to one. Whereas the density function of a beta distribution does integrate to one, okay? So they are separated by, um, they're separated by a proportional constant, okay? And so the confusion I think came is that in Wednesday's lecture, and so I should probably, I probably need to go back to Wednesday's lecture and add a slide with this kind of disclaimer and explanation, is that in Wednesday's lecture for kind of the pictures where I said, you know, the posterior is a compromise between the prior and the likelihood, which, which is true, is that in those pictures, the curve that I plotted for the likelihood, I cheated and I used the beta distribution, okay? And the reason for that is that because the beta distribution is proportional to it, it kind of amplifies it and makes it a lot taller, okay? The, the truth is, is that the beta distribute uh, the likelihood function is way more flat. Okay, so the beta distribution is proportional to the likelihood function, but the beta distribution is you know is basically the likelihood function times like a million. Okay, and so um, so if the likelihood function looks like this, the beta distribution amplifies that. Okay, it's gonna it's gonna be proportional to it, but it but it amplifies it and it allows it to be seen on the um, on the graph. If I plotted the true likelihood function on the same plot as kind of the beta distribution prior, if I plot the likelihood function on the same, uh, the true likelihood function on the same plot as the beta distribution prior, you will not see the likelihood function because the beta distribution would be, you know, would have like a height of 25 or something. And then the likelihood function would have a height of like 0.1. Okay. Um, because it's it's just way more flat because the uh, you know this constant here is 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 much smaller than the constant um, generated by a kind of a beta function and so um, so it ends up uh, just kind of way 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 flatter and so um, so you, you wouldn't be able to plot it or you wouldn't be able to see it so in those plots I cheated and I I plotted it with a Kind of a beta with a beta distribution to kind of get to, to amplify it. 
but the beta distribution is not is not equal to the likelihood function. And then um, and then the beta function or beta distribution that is proportional to it will have the parameters alpha z plus one and beta n minus z plus one. Okay. So um, so if you're trying to create a function that's proportional to it, and, and you're talking about having four hits and 10 at bets, you technically have to have a beta function with uh, alpha five and uh, beta seven, okay? Not, uh, not, not four and six. Um, I think, wait, no, four. Now I'm confusing myself. But uh, um, okay, um, yeah. So that's what we've got. All right, is that okay? Is it, I hope that clarifies a few things. So so don't use um, basically don't use d beta <laughs> when it talks about the likelihood function in your homework. Don't use d beta. I think what I'm going to have to do is go back to Wednesday's lecture and I'll I'll add a slide that explains why you're gonna see kind of the beta distribution, but it's kind of a, it's a lie, all right? Um, so I'll, I'll add a couple slides back on Wednesday's lecture to kind of correct this, because I think it confused some students. Okay, so um, let's talk uh, some Bayesian inference here. All right, so what we established, I hope, on Wednesday is this beta binomial model, okay? That the beta distribution is the conjugate prior for data with a binomial likelihood. And we said, if, um, if data comes from a binomial distribution, technically this is the likelihood for a sequence of Bernoulli's because I left off the binomial constant, but maybe, maybe I'll just replace this with proportional too. We're gonna get theta raised to the Z and one minus theta raised to the N minus Z. Okay, so I've got theta to the Z and one minus theta to the N minus Z. This is the likelihood of our data. Okay, there, there might be a proportionality constant here. The prior distribution of the parameter theta, we can use a beta distribution with parameters alpha and beta, shape parameters alpha and beta. And the PDF of this is gonna be given by this fu uh, function here. So the PDF of the, the prior distribution is given by this. And if you have this likelihood function, and if you have this prior distribution, when you multiply them, the terms will combine nicely, right? So this theta raised to the z will combine with this theta raised to the alpha minus one. The, uh, the exponents can be added together and you're gonna get theta raised to the z plus alpha minus one. Over here, you've got one minus theta raised to the n minus z and one minus theta raised to the beta minus one. And so this n minus z adds, gets added to the beta minus one and you get one minus theta raised to the n minus z plus beta minus one. So, so these, these values combine nicely. And in order to make sure that this is a PDF that integrates to one, the kind of the proportionality constant has to be this, right? And this is, this is how we can ensure. So, because if we integrate this across all possible values of theta, we're basically going to get um, this beta function value. And so to kind of make sure that it integrates to one, we're going to divide by whatever this, this thing is. All right, and so I hope, I hope this is okay. This is, uh, this is what we tried to establish on, on Wednesday, talking about the beta binomial model and kind of talk about them as conjugate priors. Okay, all right, so far so good. Any questions? All right, let me give you your first quiz answer for uh, today. The first viewing quiz answer is B as in bear. B as in bear is your first quiz answer for today. So jot that down somewhere. B as in bear. Or beta or binomial. Okay, well, anyway. Um, all right, so I've got a couple of things here. Uh, so first we'll talk about what's the mean of the beta distribution, okay? The mean of the beta distribution is going to have shape parameter uh, with shape parameters alpha and beta is going to be alpha divided by alpha plus beta. OK, 
Okay, so what's the mean? All right, so the expected value of any kind of random variable is equal to the variable times its PDF, right? The, or the integral of the variable times its PDF. So I'm gonna do um, theta times the PDF of the beta distribution, d theta, and I'm gonna evaluate it from zero to one because that's the range of theta. All right, this is a constant, so I'm gonna extract this. I'm gonna pull this out right here. Uh, and then over here, I've got uh, theta times theta, you know, I've got this thing, right? And so uh, when I multiply this times this, technically it would be theta raised to the alpha, but um, I'm gonna write it as this. I'm gonna write, write it as theta to the alpha plus one minus one, okay? And this is gonna be one minus theta to the beta minus one. And when I write it like that, we can say, uh, you know, based on kind of this identity here on the, the beta distribution, we know that this part evaluates to this, the beta function of alpha plus one comma beta. Is that okay? So uh, to go from here, because I've written this as theta to the alpha, minus, alpha plus one minus one. So this is gonna evaluate to this. Okay, and so now I'm gonna use kind of the definition. Uh, where does this come from? So, um, so, well, if you integrate this part, um, it's gonna equal this. Uh, and it's just kind of to ensure this, the purpose of this thing is to make sure that this whole thing, if I integrate it, will integrate to one, okay? And so if I integrate this part, it's gonna equal um, basically this in the numerator. And, and by dividing by beta to the alpha comma beta, or beta, beta function of alpha comma beta, it's gonna equal uh, one. This is also kind of the, like if you look at, there's a few definitions of the beta function. Okay, so, so this is one definition of the beta function. Uh, and that's basically what I'm using here. This is the, uh, we're, we're using this. So, I mean, so, um, Here I've got, instead of t's, I've got theta. And instead of x, I've got alpha. And instead of beta, I've got y. Or uh, y, I've got beta here. But basically, uh, this is this is this right here. And so this is going to evaluate to this. So this is one definition of the beta function. And then uh, another definition of the beta function is this. Okay. And so I'm, I'm going to use this definition of the beta function to kind of expand this. So I got gamma alpha plus beta times gamma of alpha, or divided by gamma alpha times gamma beta. And here I've got, um, this thing is gonna expand out to gamma of alpha plus one times gamma of beta. And the bottom will be gamma of alpha plus beta plus one. So the, these are kind of definitions of the beta function. And, uh, and the beta function is defined basically by this integral here. Um, and so uh, to kind of simplify things, okay? So the gamma function, at least for integers, is equal to basically the factorial function. So gamma of x plus one is equal to x factorial, right? So if you have gamma of x plus one, you can also rewrite it as x times gamma of x, okay? Because this, because x factorial is x times x minus one factorial and gamma of x is equal to x minus one factorial. So, um, so we, we can rewrite this as this. And so that's what I do here. I've got gamma of alpha plus one is gonna become alpha times gamma alpha, all right? And then gamma of alpha plus beta plus one becomes alpha plus beta times gamma alpha plus beta. Is that okay? And so, uh, so when I kind of multiply these all together, we're gonna get gamma alpha plus beta times alpha times gamma alpha times gamma beta. And then on the denominator, I've got gamma alpha, gamma beta. And then this becomes gamma of alpha plus beta plus one becomes alpha plus beta times mm -hmm. gamma of alpha plus beta, okay? Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's based off of the definition of the gamma function, which is basically the factorial function, okay? Except for gamma of x plus one becomes x factorial. 
at least when you're dealing um, kind of with, with, with integers here, all right? And, and maybe you're not dealing with integers, but this kind of, this relationship still holds. Okay. All right, and so uh, basically all of these gamma terms all cancel each other out. I've got gamma alpha, gamma beta here, and they cancel with these gamma alpha, gamma beta. This gamma alpha plus beta will cancel with this gamma alpha plus beta. And I'm gonna be left with alpha divided by alpha plus beta. And that is the mean of the beta distribution. It's gonna be alpha divided by alpha plus beta. Okay, yeah, so, so this, this is true, okay, for integers. And this is always true, <laughs> whether it's an integer or not. Okay, so that's just kind of the gamma function. So yeah, the gamma function is kind of like the continuous version of the factorial function. All right, so that's the, uh, the mean of the beta distribution. Okay, um, the mode of the beta distribution. Okay, so the mode or the maximum of the beta distribution uh, happens where the derivative is equal to zero. All right, so we're gonna try to find where the derivative equals zero. So we're gonna take the PDF of the um, beta distribution and we're gonna take the derivative with respect to theta and we're gonna set it equal to zero and we're gonna solve for theta, okay? Or solve for values of theta where um, this thing equals zero. Okay, so basically, uh, so this is a constant. So the derivative of that just remains that, okay? And then this becomes, uh, you know, it's a product. So you're gonna take um, derivative of the first times the second plus um, derivative of the second or the, you know, first times the derivative of the second, okay? So what is it? U, derivative of UV is, uh, I don't know, what is it? DUV plus, V, D, I don't know, whatever, something, you know, you, you know your multiple product rules. Okay, U, D, V, D, D, U, okay. Um, so anyway, uh, this becomes this, okay? So I've got um, alpha minus one raised to the theta alpha minus two, uh, one minus theta raised to the beta minus one. So that, that stays there, okay? And then over here, I've got theta to the alpha minus one times the derivative of this thing, which is gonna be beta minus one times one minus theta raised to the beta minus two times uh, because of chain rule negative one and then uh, from here if you look at this you can extract out a theta to the alpha minus two and a one minus theta to the beta minus two okay and if you do that this uh, you will be left with alpha minus one times one minus theta and then if you look at this term over here you can also extract out a theta to the alpha minus two and a one minus theta to the beta minus two, and you will be left with a theta and a beta minus one, um, and a beta minus one, okay? Because this will get extract, uh, extracted out, okay? So you got uh, three factors here, theta to the alpha minus two, one minus theta to the beta minus two, and then, uh, and then this factor, okay? So technically the derivative is also zero at theta equals zero, because uh, if, when this thing is equal to zero, it will equal zero. When theta equals one, this thing will also, uh, this will equal zero and then uh, the function will equal zero. And then the derivative is also equal to zero when this thing is equal to zero, okay? So, um, so I'm gonna just get rid of these, okay? Cause I know that these, so if theta equals zero or one minus theta or theta equals one, uh, I know that uh, this equation will hold, but so now we're gonna just solve, assume, you know, assuming theta is not zero or one, we're gonna solve for the maximum where, um, where this, this factor is equal to zero, okay? So we're gonna solve for whether this factor is equal to zero. So if you expand this out and, uh, and you combine the terms, okay, you're gonna get this. And then, um, and from here you can kind of extract a theta. So I've got alpha minus one minus theta times alpha plus beta minus two. And we're solving for theta, so I just bring this to the other side. And uh, a solution for theta is alpha minus one divided by alpha plus beta minus two. Okay, 
Is that all right? So that, um, so wait, what is this? The beta alpha beta is missing on the second line. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I should, okay, you are correct. I need to have a larger parentheses around here. You're right. So, so I, I, I should have a, um, I should put a parentheses around this and this. Okay, so I should have a, that's a good, um, good catch there and opening a left and a right parentheses. Let me do that before I forget. Left parentheses and right parentheses. Hopefully that does it. How did this send up in there? <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, and then, uh, all right, so let's see. May I ask why mode and maximum are the same thing here? The, uh, the, the, the mode is, uh, is basically the, the peak the, the peak of the, um, of the, uh, of the density curve, I'm like losing words here. Okay, yeah, so the, the mode of, of the, the density function is gonna be the maximum here, okay? All right, okay, so that should fix it. Now I've got a parentheses around here and we're, we're, and we're good. Okay, and, um, all right, so anyway, that's the uh, the mean of the beta, and this is the mode of the beta. And again, if, if we checked Wikipedia, we, I mean, we could have made our life easier. We could have just gone straight to Wikipedia and we would have seen the mode is equal to this. <laughs> um, okay, so so that's what we have here. And um, oh yeah, I guess there, there is an assumption that, um, that, that alpha is greater than one and beta is greater than one. Um, Okay, so with uh, with Bayesian statistics, um, you know we can make probability intervals, and these are basically the alternative to a confidence interval. And so, in frequentist statistics, we make a confidence interval. We treat the parameter as fixed, and uh, and so we don't talk about the probability that some value that the parameter falls inside the confidence interval. That's like against the rules and frequency statistics. But in Bayesian statistics, the parameter is a random variable. So we can talk about there being, you know, this probability, a 95% probability that the random variable is within the chosen bounds of the interval. And so there's a couple ways to creating a credibility interval. And so you have the equal tail credibility interval, and you also have the highest posterior density interval. Okay, so I'm just going to show you these. So the equal tail interval says that the area above the interval is equal to the area below the interval. And so if the uh, posterior distribution is known, then you can use the quantile function and use that, right? So, so this is unrelated to uh, any of the other things, but let's say the posterior distribution is a gamma distribution with the following parameters, okay? So we're going to say the gamma distribution has shape parameters 5 and rate 1.5. And so for the 95% credibility interval, we want 2.5% below and 2.5% above. So we're going to find the percent, uh, quantiles for 0.025 and 0.975. And so this will form the bounds. And to get the, the quantiles, we use the Q function. And because we've got a gamma distribution, it's going to be Q gamma. And you would use shape and rate. Okay, uh, I think in your homework, you have to do this for the beta distribution. So you're going to use Q beta and you basically plug in 0 0.025, 0.97. So you're going to get the bounds of your credibility interval like this. Okay, so it says um, on the lower side, I've got 1.08 and on the upper side, I've got 6.83 basically. And if I plot that, this is what it looks like. Okay, so I don't know if you, I don't know if you ever use library mosaic, but there's a nice little function called um, basically the XP family of functions, and it will kind of create nice plots and shade everything in 
uh, all nice and pretty uh, using ggplot as kind of a it, its base here, right? So, so when you load up library mosaic, there's like a, a bajillion messages that pop up, but um, but it makes these graphs nice and easy for us to do. Okay, so anyway, what we see is that this shaded area has two and a half percent. This shaded area has two and a half percent, and this shaded area in here has ninety five percent. So this is a ninety five. This region, there's a ninety five percent probability that uh, whatever parameter you're looking for falls inside this region here. Okay, so that's that's the equal tail interval. You've got this this tail area is equal to this tail area. For the highest density interval, it's going to kind of basically find the narrowest range that cover 95% of the posterior distribution, right? And one thing to note here is that the height of the density function at the lower bound is going to equal the height of the density function at the upper bound, okay? And so there's a, there's a library called HD interval for the highest density interval. And, uh, and you use the function HDI and it's gonna give you the bounds of your interval. So here I'm gonna say HDI. Um, again, we're gonna say we've got a gamma distribution with shape and rate parameters five and 1.5. And so you're gonna say, um, please you, HDI do it for the gamma function. Uh, the interval, I want it to be a 95% interval. So the credibility mass is gonna be 0.95. Shape is shape and rate is rate. So shape is five and rate is 1.5. And it says the bounds of your interval is gonna be this, 0 0.804, 805, and 6.28, 6.29, something around there, okay? And when you create the plot here, you get this picture, all right? So you have 95% in the middle you don't have equal, this area is not equal to this area, okay? If you look, this area, according to this, is less than 1%, 0 0.008. And this side has an area of close to, you know, over 4%, 0 0.042, okay? But the middle is 95%. And the height right here, this height is the exact same height as this height over here, okay? So it's kind of like um, if you have like a rising sea level, right? Um, and this is like the uh, the mountain. Um, this the water would cover. You know, the the height over here is equal to the height over here. Okay, if it doesn't look equal, it's just an optical illusion because this has a shallower slope and this has a steeper slope. But um, but this height over here is equal to this height over here. And that's that's the highest density interval. Okay, um, which one should you use? It it doesn't matter. It I, whether you use the equal tail interval or the highest posterior density interval, it's correct to say that there's a 95% probability that the unknown parameter falls within the bounds of the interval. So it's correct to say that there's a 95% probability. And, um, and again, this when we talk about probability here, it, reflect, uh, it reflects our subjective belief about the random variable. So this posterior distribution, whatever it is you created, depends on basically your prior, prior distribution, right? And so when we create a credibility interval um, based on a posterior distribution, that it reflects your subjective beliefs, okay? Maybe you've incorporated your data, but it's kind of a sub subjective probability belief. And um, and so this is an important thing to note in Bayesian statistics is that it incorporates prior knowledge in the form of a prior distribution, okay? Um, and so, you know, this, this is kind of um, maybe a conflicting point between frequentists and Bayesians is that frequentists will say, um, Let's only use what the data says. Okay, uh, let 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 the data speak for itself. Don't try to influence it with any kind of prior information. And then the Bayesian kind of argues that no, if if you know something ahead of time, like let that inform some of uh, some of your ideas here. Okay, 
And so um, this, I have you create confidence intervals and credibility intervals in your homework uh, for kind of the batting average. And what you'll note is that the credibility interval, especially when you have less data, in, um, so in the first example, I think there's 10 hits and or 10 at bats and four hits or something. And I say, make a confidence interval and make a credibility interval. Um, the credibility interval at that time is going to basically be almost entirely dependent on your prior knowledge, right? Your prior knowledge says that batting averages are, are going to strictly be between 0.2 and 0.4. Um, you know, most everybody's above 0.2. Uh, most people are below 0.3, you're going to have no one above 0.4. That's kind of your prior, your prior beliefs. And so when you create a credibility interval based on little data, it's going to be, look a lot more like your prior distribution or, or it will be greatly influenced by the prior distribution. Um, as you gather more data, as you have more observed data, the resulting credibility interval will get be more influenced by the data that you have seen. Okay, as you, as you gather more data, your credibility interval is going to be more influenced by the data. Okay, uh, on the other hand, when you create a confidence interval, the confidence interval is determined only by the observed data. So if you have four hits and ten at bats, your confidence interval is centered at 0.4. Okay, and you know, as you know somebody who's familiar with baseball will know that there's no way that somebody can kind of maintain a batting average of 0.4 for like, you know, even like the entire season. And so, um, so when you have little data available, your confidence interval is going to have very big, large margins of error. And as you have more data, you're going to end up with smaller margins of error. Okay. But the confidence interval is always going to be determined just by the observed data. Um, whereas the credibility interval is going to incorporate your prior beliefs. There's, there's like a, I don't know how funny this is, but there's a comic. XKCD, there's always kind of a So, you know, this is a contrived scenario, but um, the question is, did the sun just explode? And we've got this neutrino detector that will de measure whether the sun has exploded. <laughs> but it rolls two dice, and if they both come up as the number six, it lies to us. Otherwise, it tells the truth. And we says, let's try the detector. Has the sun gone nova? And uh, it rolls dice, and then it reports, yes, the sun has exploded. OK, and so the frequentist uses only the data that's available. And we'll say, OK, the probability of this result of happening by chance is 1 in 36.027. And because that probability is less than 0 0.05, we will conclude that the sun has exploded. OK, and the Bayesian says, I bet you, I bet you 50 bucks that it hasn't. OK. And, um, and the joke here is that, you know, by limiting yourself to only kind of the data at hand, if your data says something a little bit crazy, the frequentist will just kind of go along with it, right? Like if this player has four hits and 10 at bats, the frequentist will say, well, the, the estimate of this player's batting average is 400, four, you know, 0.4, which is, which is really, really, really high. Okay, um, and uh, and the and the Bayesian will kind of factor in basically other knowledge and say, you know, it, it, it's got to be different than that. Okay, in this scenario with the sun exploding, the frequentist goes off of this and says, well, what's the probability of getting this result? It's quite low, so you know we would reject the null hypothesis. The Bayesian will factor in kind of other information, just kind of like. I don't think the sun's going to explode, right? The probability of the sun exploding is is pretty low to begin with, and so um, so he's doubtful of these of this outcome. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and if it's gone over, fifty bucks won't matter. Yeah, that's beside the point. But just kind of, it, it's kind of just this extremely you know silly scenario of, of some kind of situation where um, the uh, the thing doesn't matter, right? So 
Um, all right, the, um, okay, so all of this stuff, um, this beta binomial thing, the, these are what we call a pair of conjugate distributions. This is, I just copied and pasted directly from Wikipedia. In Bayesian probability theory, if the posterior distribution are in the same probability distribution family as the prior probability distribution, the prior and posterior are called conjugate distributions and the prior is called the conjugate prior for the likelihood function. So in our case, the prior distribution is a beta distribution. The likelihood is binomial data, but then when you combine the binomial with the prior, the resulting posterior distribution still ends up being a beta distribution. We have to adjust the parameters. It ends up being a beta distribution with alpha plus Z and beta equal to uh, N minus Z plus, uh, plus beta and things like that. But, um, but the posterior distribution is still in the form of a prior distribution. There are a bunch of other important or kind of uh, useful conjugate prior pairs. So you have, um, uh, I think in your homework, I gave you a few examples to work through. I think one of them is a uh, gamma prior with is it exponential or Poisson data? I, I can't remember what I gave you in the homework. Okay, either uh, data comes from an exponential or Poisson distribution, I think exponential, and then you have a gamma prior. And then um, and then the last one, which is a little bit math heavy, is uh, you know you have a norm, you have normally distributed data in a normal distribution prior, um, and, and those kind of combine as well, okay? All right. Let's say we want to make predictions with the posterior distribution. So let's go back to our baseball example. We said our prior distribution is beta with alpha equal to 81 and beta equal to 219. Uh, we observe a new player, 10 at bats gets five hits. Based on this, our posterior distribution for theta is now going to be a nut, uh, beta distribution with alpha equal to 86 and beta equal to 224. I forgot, how many um, quiz answers have I given you? Just one? Have I given you the second one yet? No. OK, second one is D as in dog. OK, D as in dog will be the second quiz answer. And then remind me to give you your third quiz answer before we end class. So second quiz answer is D as in dog. OK, so our posterior distribution for theta, now that we've observed this data, is going to have alpha equal to 86, beta equal to 224. And we're faced with this question, if this player has three at-bats in the next game, what's the probability that he gets exactly two hits? Okay. And so that question in of itself is not hard. The answer is gonna be three choose two, theta raised to the two, one minus theta to the one, right? What's the probability he gets two hits and three at-bats? That's just a binomial probability, okay? But, the problem here is that we don't know the value of theta because it's a random variable. So what do you do, right? Theta is a random variable. So what is this answer going to be? Okay. Well, it's going to depend on what that theta is. Okay. And so there's a few, few strategies we can use for dealing with an unknown theta. One is we can use a single value and we'll plug in the mean of the posterior distribution. Okay. One is we use a single value and we plug in the mode of the posterior distribution. So these are, these are strategies that you just plug in one value, okay? And then we can find the expected value analytically or, uh, and this is gonna be basically the driving motivation behind our course, the rest of our course, is that we're gonna ex estimate this expected value using Monte Carlo methods. All right, so. If you're good with just plugging in one number, you can plug in the mean and you say, okay, well, the posterior distribution, it has alpha 86, beta 224. And so the mean is gonna be 0.2774194. You plug that in and then you get this number. Okay, so I think that's, that's easy and straightforward. Um, or you could say, you know what? I'm gonna plug in, um, the mode, okay? So you've got this posterior distribution. The mode is a slightly different number. You plug that number in and you get this, okay? You get 0.1654, right? 
So when you plug in the mean, you get 0.1668. When you plug in the mode, you get 0.1654. And, uh, and that's it. That's just plugging in one number and assuming that theta is equal to that one number. Okay. I think this is better than just plugging in um, the frequentist. The frequentist would say, you know, your data is five hits, 10 at bats, your maximum likelihood estimate is 0.5. So you, if you plug in 0.5, I think your answer is going to be kind of a little bit overly optimistic about this player's ability. Okay. All right. So probably uh, the better approach, though, would be to find the expected value of this probability. Okay. And one way we can do this is to find the expected value of the probability analytically. Okay. And so there's the theorem, law of the unconscious statistician, which says, to calculate the expected value of a function, right? So this is what we've got. We've got some function g of x and, uh, and it's the function applied to a random variable. We can do it if we know the probability distribution of x, but we don't know the distribution of g of x itself, okay? So the expected value of g of x is gonna equal the integral of g of x times f, f of x, okay? Where f of x, this is the PDF in our case, f of x is the PDF of the beta distribution with alpha equal to 86 and beta equal to 24. Okay, and then g of x, this is the function that we want to know the probability of. This is the probability of getting two hits in three at bats. All right, so we've got three choose two, theta squared, one minus theta to the one. Okay, and so the expected value of this function applied to kind of the random variable theta here is going to be the integral across all possible values of theta from 0 to 1 of g of x, 3 choose 2, theta squared, 1 minus theta to the 1 of g of x times the PDF of this beta distribution, okay, which is going to be 1 over beta 86, 224, theta to the 86 minus 1, 1 minus theta to the 224 minus 1. Okay. Is that okay? All right, and so now we have to solve this analytically, okay? So we're going to solve this analytically, and, um, and I hope you can follow along here. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to pull out the constants. So 3 choose 2 is 3, and uh, 1 over beta 86, 224, I'm going to just pull that out as well. 1 over 86, beta 224, okay? And then uh, I've got theta squared, 1 minus theta to the 1. That's going to multiply with this. Okay, so theta squared times theta to the 86 minus one becomes theta to the 88 minus one. And one minus theta to the one becomes one minus theta to the 224 minus one. So I get one minus theta to the 225 minus one. And so this becomes beta 88, 225. And over here, I've got beta 86, 224. Okay, all right. So now I'm gonna kind of expand this and so this becomes uh, gamma of 86 plus 224 divided by gamma 86 times gamma 224. This becomes gamma 88 times gamma 225 divided by gamma 88 plus 225. So these are all, again, you can kind of just treat these gamma functions as factorials, right? So, okay, 86 plus 224 adds up to 310. 88 plus 225 add up to 313. And then I just kind of rearrange these terms. I've got gamma 88 over gamma 86, gamma 225 over gamma 224 here. All right. Okay, have I lost anybody along the way here? Or are we doing okay? You guys are good? Okay, so gamma 310 becomes 309 factorial. Gamma 313 becomes 312 factorial. Gamma 88 becomes 87 factorial. Here I've got 85 factorial. And here uh, I've got 225, it becomes 224 factorial. And 224 becomes 223 factorial. Okay, and then so you can kind of uh, simplify the factorials. So I've got 312 factorial on the bottom. And if you have 309 factorial on the top, it's gonna to become one divided by 310 times 311 times 312. 87 factorial is 87 times 86 times 85 factorial. So 
that, that eliminates and 224 factorial becomes 224 times 223 all the way down. And so we can delete this and we get this. All right, and so, uh, and then don't forget the three from three choose two. So if we include this over here, our overall probability becomes 0 0.16715. 16715. All right, so I mean, all of these numbers are kind of ending up similar to each other, but they're slightly different, right? So the mo the mean gives us 0 0.1668. The mode gives us 0 0.1654. The expected value ends up being 0 0.16715, okay? Now, this was a little bit of a pain to do, right? To work through the solution analytically. Like we could do it, and thank goodness for this identity, okay, of the beta function that, thank goodness for, for this, where we say the beta function is equal to this quantity, because otherwise, how would we have figured this out, right? The only other option here would be to expand this. We've got one minus theta to the 224th power, and what are you gonna do? You're gonna expand that polynomial into something egregiously large. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess it's, it's just a polynomial and it can be done, but you know, it'd be completely painful and miserable to do. So, um, anyway, so thankfully we've got this thing and, and we were able to solve it, but there, there might be situations where this, this thing, you know, can't be, uh, done analytically. Okay. I mean, we, we did it analytically. Okay. So what the other approach is we can, estimate the expected value of the probability via Monte Carlo, all right? And basically, what it says is that if you want the expected value of this function, you know, this is the analytic approach, but what you can do is you can just take the mean of g applied to x, x sub j, where x sub j are a whole bunch of values drawn from the random distribution. The random distribution with this PDF Okay, the random distribution of uh, defined by this PDF, if you, if you have values from it, you can just apply the function to that and take the mean, okay? And so what we have is we've got f of x is the beta distribution with alpha equal to 86 and beta equal to 224. And R has a random beta number generator, okay? So we can just use R beta to generate values from this PDF, okay? So we can generate a whole bunch of these xj values. And, uh, and then g of x is just this thing, three choose two, okay? All right, so uh, here, I'm gonna just do set seed one. I use sample to generate a whole bunch of theta values, okay? I'm gonna just generate a whole bunch of these things. I'm gonna generate one million of them, 10 to the six. Okay, and this is uh, using R beta to generate 1 million random beta values with parameters 86 and 224. Okay, and then G is a function of theta where I'm going to get three. So three choose two is three times theta squared times one minus theta to the one. Okay, so this is the function. And then, so now that I have a million values in my sample, I'm going to apply G to that sample. So I've got uh, a million values of the function applied to the sample. And, and then I'm going to take the mean of all of those million values. All right. And so this, this right here, this is an estimate of the expected value. All right. And so I get 0 0.1671577. 0 0.1671577. Let's compare that to the analytics solution. The analytic solution is 0 0.1671515. So 0 0.1671515. I have match up to five decimal places, 0.1671577, okay? So these last two digits differ ever so slightly. So this is a very good estimate. This is off by, I don't know, a very, very, very small amount, right? Okay, so all to say is that 
here I didn't have to do any I didn't have to do any of this stuff okay like like we could work through this analytically but it's a bit of a pain and and if you understand how to do the Monte Carlo methods you can just say well uh, just give me a whole bunch of random numbers okay and it's not hard to ask for a million random numbers and then you just plug in the number now you might have a more complicated thing where maybe getting a million values is, is hard. And so you say, well, okay, just give me a hundred thousand or give me 10,000 and, and you'll still get an estimate. Maybe it won't be as accurate, but you'll still get an estimate here. Okay. And so, so this is going to be the motivation for kind of uh, the rest of the class is that we can compare, uh, you know, um, so if we compare the Monte Carlo estimate to the, analytic answer, we, we see that the Monte Carlo estimate is good. And for a lot of these problems, the analytic math will be intractable and we can't do it, or it's just going to be hard to solve, or we're lazy, okay? And, uh, and the answer, uh, <laughs> and we're lazy is going to happen a lot too, okay? Like you might have this thing and you'll be like, uh, maybe I can work through this, but it also just like, uh, I don't, I don't want to, okay? And a lot of times you can just get a pretty good estimate using Monte Carlo methods, all right? And so for a lot of these problems, we can get uh, use the Monte Carlo estimate method to get an estimate. It's not going to be 100% accurate, but it's going to get you pretty close, at least in the ballpark, okay? And uh, and we use these in Bayesian Bayesian statistics frequently because you know the parameters of random value or ra yeah random variable, and solving these problems if it's a random variable you often have to deal with some kind of integral like this, okay? And because of that, the Monte Carlo approach uh, works well. Okay, sorry for going a couple minutes over here. Um, the last quiz answer for today is E as an elephant. E as an elephant is your last quiz answer. All right, we will uh, we'll end here. Have a good weekend, you guys, and we'll see you guys on Monday. And... Um, and that's it. Okay. Um, all right. Thanks, guys. Let me go ahead and stop the recording. So have a good weekend.